theme emerged, which I did not intend in writing The Lost Girls of Paris. And that is a very timely theme of the trust that we place in our government and whether Mm. such trust is warranted. Welcome to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline. I'm your host, Monica Hadley, and with me is my co-host and mother, Caroline Kilborn. And hello, everyone. (laughs) I hope you're having a good day today. The sun is shining here in uh, Mount Pleasant, Iowa, so that makes everybody happy. <clears throat> that is true, although we are just coming out of an ice storm and out of a polar <laughs> vortex. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm iced in, but then, but that's okay. I don't have to go anywhere today. <laughs> well, that's good, because we get to travel the world with our, with our authors here on Red That's Christmas. right. That's right. So where are we going today? Well, today we're going uh, to talk to Pam Jenoff, and she is the author of several novels of historical fiction, including the international bestseller, The Commandant's Girl, and she holds a bachelor's degree in international affairs from George Washington University and a master's degree in history from Cambridge, and she received her Juris Doctor from the University of Pennsylvania. Her novels are inspired by her experiences working at the Pentagon and also as a diplomat for the State Department, handling Holocaust issues in Poland. She lives with her husband and three children in near Philadelphia, where in addition to writing, she teaches law school. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) Welcome to Writer's Voices, Pam. Thank you for having me. And which direction from Philadelphia are you? I'm just east of Philadelphia in New Jersey. So if you sort of look out my office window, you see Philadelphia. Okay. Well, um, I grew up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which is west of Philadelphia. My husband is from Lancaster, and we spend a lot of time out there. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, it's a, it's my father's family was there for 13 generations. So uh, we have a lot of, lot of connections with, uh, with Lancaster. So the new book is called Lost Girls in Paris. Did I get that right? Yes, Lost Girls, the Lost of, Girls Paris. of Paris. Of Paris. The Lost Girls cool. of Paris. Tell us a little bit about the background of the story and why you decided to write this book. Well, I was researching for my next idea, and I came across the incredible story of the women who had served Britain's special operations executive. And I just have to tell you a few words about that. So Special Operations Executive, or SOE as it was called, was an agency created by Winston Churchill in the darkest days of World War II when things weren't going terribly well for the Brits. And the mission of the agency was to set Europe ablaze, in his own words. So the agents were meant to go into occupied Europe. Um, They were dropped in, and they engaged in sabotage and subversion. So that's blowing up of railway bridges and factories that were helping the Germans, um, and also liaising with local partisans, and the, e- the idea was to make things easier for the Allied troops when the cross-channel invasion finally came. Um, th- this was originally a group of men who did this work, but men were detected too easily on the streets of France because most of the men were either conscripted or imprisoned, the young men, and so an idea was raised, let's send women and they began, began recruiting women uh, to join SOE, and they, the women trained alongside the men, and they were dropped behind enemy lines, and they did incredible work as radio operators and couriers and all sorts of things. Um, and, and unfortunately, as they became more successful, the Germans became more aggressive in trying to detect them, and many of the agents, male and female, were arrested and killed by the Germans. And this is the true story that inspired the lost girls of Paris okay we were wondering if it was true and that's that's and it's it's something else I'll tell you the fact that these women were willing to give up their lives and go you know Let me say I always refer to my books as inspired by true events rather than based on true events because I don't ever want to stake too large a claim. You know, I take a lot of liberties with fiction, but everything I told you about the history just now is absolutely true. Mm -hmm. Now, because this was an intelligence operation, I imagine a lot of the details are hard to come by. Well, it's interesting. A ton of really good nonfiction 
has been written about special operations executive and about the women. So there's a very good book called A Life in Secrets, um, which was about the woman who was their kind of spy handler, Vera Atkins, in real life, and other books. So a decent amount was actually written, and for me the challenge was not to go too far down the rabbit hole of research where you simply can't write a word because you're too caught up. (laughs) So how do you avoid doing that? Well, I'll tell you, this was the first project where I had this volume of material to work with. Other projects, I'm scrambling for details. But here, there was a lot to work with, and at some point you have to say, okay, stop. I can't read more of these incredible stories of the women's heroism. Um, I can't incorporate this or I can't incorporate that. And you have to work to really finely weave in the details so you don't do that famous history dump in the middle of your story where you put too much information. Mm-hmm. Well, the in the Lost Girls of Paris, you you wrap the story in a mystery, as well. And was there any um, anything that that was inspired by in terms of um, you know the the death? I mean, the, the book it's not a spoiler because it starts out very no at the beginning that this woman gets killed in New York, and then um, the the main character, and this is after the war, and she's trying to find out who this woman was, and what her connection to the SOE was. So is there any historical accuracy there? Okay, so um, uh, let me tell you what is true, and then I will will back up and tell you a little bit about my story and how I frame it with the mystery. So what is true is that um, about 12 of the British women were captured and never returned, and they were killed under a German program called Nacht und Nebel, Night and Fog, and it was a program designed to make the worst enemies of the Reich disappear without a trace. And mm-hmm. in real life, the, the woman who was in charge of the SOE, the female agents, was a woman in London named Vera Atkins, and she had recruited and deployed the girls. And after they were caught, she went to Europe, to post-war Europe, trying to find answers, not just about what had happened to her girls, but because she found out they had been killed, but why and how they were sort of captured. And there were, in real life, numerous theories of betrayal, of how the girls were betrayed, and one or more of them absolutely may have been true. Um, So in my book, um, as you know, I have one of the spies, one of, I'm sorry, one of the female agents in occupied France, Marie, and she's one of the girls who's operating on the ground. I also have the story in my book of Eleanor Trigg, and Eleanor Trigg is my spy handler who was inspired by the real-life Vera Atkins. And then in my book, I have a third character, and this is where the most liberties in my story come in, because my character in 1946, Manhattan, is a woman named Grace Healy, and this is a wholly fictitious character. Grace is what I call not quite a war widow. She lost her husband during World War II, um, but not to combat. He was killed in an accident pre-deployment. And so Grace is living alone in New York, wrestling with her grief and her future when she discovers a suitcase in Grand Central containing the pictures of 12 girls. And the suitcase has the name on the outside, Trigg, who's the spy handler. And she soon learns that the reason Eleanor never came to claim her suitcase is she was killed in an accident outside Grand Central. So Grace's story and her solving of the mystery is pure fiction, um, but the spy handler and the betrayals come from real history. Well, that's that's really that's really something that you were able to weave that together because it all seems so real. The whole thing, you know what I mean? Thank <laughs> you. You read it. <laughs> I know, I know. Although there there were a few things that Grace did uh, was able to do in her investigation that that might have been difficult for a real real person to have done i won't i won't give away any more than that but um. well you know it's an interesting question because there were times when i wrestled with should i have made grace a modern day character you know Uh looking back at this mystery because it certainly would have been easier if grace could have hopped on a plane to london or jumped on the internet you know Mm -hmm. um but i didn't have those options at my disposal with a woman in 1946 it was quite challenging i bet Mm -hmm. i bet what what led you to frame the story this way rather than just tell the story of, of Eleanor and Marie? 
you know, I think Grace is just such an interesting character. First of all, it gave me a chance to show a bit of what life was back here, uh, like here on the home front after the war, um, which was interesting. I always find the periods just after a war to be very interesting when societies are trying to come back to normal. And so I was able to show that um, through Grace's life in New York, but also by having Grace have her own personal struggle and her, you know, things that she's running away from in her past, um, it sort of helped when she got caught up in the mystery of the girls because she was engaging in a journey both for herself and for them. So I, I, I like the complexity of it. Now, the characters of the girls in Paris, there were two main ones that, that it focused on Marie and Josie, um, and then some of the men that they interacted with as well. Were either of those inspired by a particular person that you found about found out about in your research, or or were any of the men on the ground inspired by someone so, in particular? The women were very much composite characters um, in that there were just so many women and so many heroic stories that I couldn't possibly do them justice. So I pulled from here and I pulled from there. Now, Josie, by way of her background, is inspired by um, a woman who was named Noor, um, Noor Khan, and she was actually a Sufi princess you know, of descended from a royal family, and she served. And so in some sense, um, in the scantest of sense, I'd say Josie was inspired by that particular woman. The the main, main men in the book, um, Julian and his cousin, um, they were inspired by real people. So in my book, the, the circuit, the, these operators, these SOE operators, worked in small circuits or groups um, or networks. And in my book, it's called the Vesper Circuit. And in real life, mm -hmm. it was called the, Pros the Prosper Circuit. And, um, and sort of by the man who ran that circuit would have inspired the one character. And there was also kind of a rogue pilot um, who, was, who was a bit questionable in real life. And I drew from him as well. <laughs> well I, I like the way you wrote the, wrote the book uh, chapter by chapter in, in each like for instance, chapter nine, it's about Marie, and and then the you know it it just instead of trying to tell the whole story in one you know it's just it, it the way you the way you wrote it made it easier to read for me, and I I, I appreciate that, that each chapter is focusing on a specific character mm -hmm. and what they're experiencing yeah, yeah instead of jumping yeah what's around going on with them yeah. yeah. Is that something oh, that's, that you that's tend interesting. is that something you tend to do in your writing? I have done books from all different perspectives. First of all, I've written in, I've written in past and, and present tense, which is always a question. I've written from first person and, and I've written from third person, which is also a question. And I've done it from one, two, and three points of view. So my previous book, The Orphan's Tale, went between two women back and forth. And that was the first time I had really struggled with, you know, the balance because it wasn't always one than the other. Sometimes a character needs a few chapters to unfold a part of the story. Um, and that's where I learned it really wasn't about, you know, perfect, I guess, you know, perfect symmetry, but overall balance. And then I came to this book and I viewed the three women very much as like braiding, you know, when you're braiding three strands together was kind of how I thought of it. Now, in The Orphan's Tale, which is the book that we interviewed you about a couple of years ago, the two characters were both in the same place and time. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, yes. so in a way, in in this situation, in, in The Lost Girls of Paris, all three characters are in different places most of the time. There is some overlap, but, um, and in a different time, not, you know, not generations apart, but a few years apart in, in the case of Grace. Did that make it more complicated to write? Absolutely. You know, this book, I don't think the books get any easier. The <laughs> challenges just get different. So when I had Orphan's Tale, there was this big emotional challenge in writing that story because it was so gut-wrenching. Here, the challenge was exactly as you're describing, how do you take three women and multiple countries and different time periods and bring them together? And there were points that I almost had to opt for simplicity. So at one point, I would have taken 
Eleanor's story and started when the when the whole thing blows up and falls apart, and then go go, 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 go back to the beginning. That was my original idea, and it just wasn't going to work because it made it even more complicated. Mm. So I, within each story, I wound up going a bit more in a linear fashion to keep it chronological yeah chronological I think that makes a lot of sense because if you're jumping around too much in in the in terms of the story it can get hard for people to follow I I would have lost me you know much (laughs) less the reader so yes exactly I did a lot of I'm not really a visual person I don't often do charts but this book was the first time I had color coding and different color post-its and everything else. So did you, did you have a wall? Like you put everything up on the um, wall? You know, I actually did it, I think, on a folder. I had it on this, this kind of binder where each different one was a different color, and I, I laid them out so I could see if they were roughly balanced, that sort of thing. Oh, interesting. Did you tend to write one person's story like all at once and then the other, or did you did you go back and forth? between the characters as you were writing. It's interesting. I can't remember if we talked about this last time, but you know how there are plotters and pantsers? So the plotters write in a linear or chronological fashion, and the pantsers just go by the seat of their pants. Mm -hmm. I'm a pantser, which means I control nothing about the way things come out on the page. It just all comes out in random order. So that's hard anyway, but all three of them were clearly mushed together in that first – Forgive me, vomiting of words. <laughs> okay, so you had a first draft that was that was not structured the way your your book ended up being. Can you kind of walk us through your process of how you separate it and and how the structure does how the structure um, comes about? Because you ended up with a really an excellent structure. <laughs> Thank you. Well, let me say this. So I'll tell you as well as I can remember. So with a project, I have an idea. I open or turn on a computer, and I go, blah, like for three or four or six months, and just all these words come out in random order. And then at some point, that document becomes terribly unwieldy, and then I start doing chapters, and I start doing outlines and charts and all the rest. But it's still very messy at that point. So then I have to go back within those and kind of make all the words make sense and start making it look pretty, you know, the actual language. And then that's when you start seeing the problems and where the story arc works and where the story arc doesn't work. So you're getting to that stage. And then you have to look for the inconsistencies, the places where different things in the three stories don't match up or where you have to flip-flop two chapters because you don't want them to know something from Marie before something from Eleanor. So you start looking (laughs) at all of that. Um, I don't give anything to my editor until it's really far completed, until it's pretty much done, because as kind of that person that throws it all out there, it's not like I have chapters finished first. It's not like I can give you sample chapters. Nothing is finished till the whole thing is finished. Um, and so, but then my editor would look at it when it was finished, and she would say, okay, you know, this doesn't work, or, you know, can we do more here? So then it goes through more changes like that. That's about as much as I can remember. <laughs> That's, well, that makes a lot of sense. and It does, yeah. But So in your first, um, first draft, the messy one, do you pretty much have the plot, the overall plot, and the characters nailed down at that point? To some extent. So I don't know the plot ahead of time. Um, I start with an opening image. I have some idea where I'll wind up at the end, although I've been surprised. And then in the middle, it's a big (laughs) mess, and it often helps if there are what I call high moments. So if there's one or two beacons of scenes that I can see in the middle to work around, that is very, very helpful for me. So I'm going through this process, and I'm forming, and as so the plot develops as I'm doing this formation, And so do the characters. I don't do character sketches. I don't interview my characters. They come through the story. So someone once described it as plotters use scaffolding and they build around the scaffolding, but pantsers, you're more like a fossil dig. 
So I'm holding something and I'm brushing it off and I don't know quite what it is yet until I see it. And that's how the characters come through. So by the end of a first draft, I definitely have a pretty good idea. Um, But I turn in pretty awful first drafts. My work needs a lot of editing. And as in contrast to people who write too much, I'm on the sparse side on that first draft. So Mm -hmm. often I'm getting the feedback to go deeper here or develop it more there. But you don't actually show your editor the first draft. Correct. No, she's probably seeing a third, a third or a fifth draft. But so even I at need that to point? build. A, I know who they are, but yeah. I might have not done enough work one way or the other. So um, you know, I always say it's sort of like cooking. At some point, I'm going to know that this book needs more. Um, but I don't always know what it is, like a little pepper, a little salt, something. So there's a point at which, even though I'm not 100% happy with it, it's a good enough point to show it to her. But I don't, I can't really label that as if it, is it a first, third, or fifth draft <laughs> that we're talking about. And is there anyone that you show that really rough first draft to? Nobody. That Nobody. the first one, will, the first one who will see things. The first one who will see things. Two people will see things is my are my agent and my editor. I'm, I'm not in a workshop right now, so it's just the two of them. Oh, what and about then, your What the, about your husband? No, the no. first, <laughs> and then once we have a bound or wor- like a a working draft that you know that we're like it's in some sort of tight bound form, the first person who gets a copy after after the editorial people will be my mom, um, oh. and she's a really good proofreader. <laughs> You're listening, you're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is Pam Genoff, author of The Lost Girls of Paris. And am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yes. Okay, great. So, Pam, you have written and published, will this be the ninth book? Tenth, actually. Tenth, okay. And wow. the, the two that we've talked to you about are both set in World War II. Are all of your books set in World War II? Um, Not all of them. So of the ten, two were modern, and maybe one was a modern historical hybrid. Um, The others are mostly historical, and they are mostly centered around World War II, although I did have one that was World War I. It seems like World War II fiction is really having a moment, that it's, very popular, and there's quite a bit of it out there. Were you one of the ones who started this trend? (laughs) I sometimes think of myself as like the great-grandmother of it, of this generation. You know, Commandant's Girl came out in 2007, um, so um, kind of on the front end of this wave. um, And then there's been a tremendous wave, and I had a moment a few years ago after The Nightingale came out and after All the Light We Cannot See came out. And I wondered, is World War II done? Has it really been played out? And then I looked over, and four of the 15 titles on the New York Times bestseller list were still World War II after that. So it seemed that there was kind of a lot left to be said um, for the war. Um, So I, I think it comes from the fact that there's a lot of archives from Eastern Europe that only became available to us after the Cold War um, that I think give us material for stories. The survivors are getting up there in years and we want to capture their stories. And also really fundamentally, as a writer, I want to take you and put you in the shoes of my protagonist and have you ask, what would I have done? And World War II has such dire circumstances and such stark choices that it's really fertile ground for storytelling. Mm-hmm. I don't. There's so much there, so much history, so much. I, I doubt if it'll ever there'll ever be enough written about it. I hope. I hope there's never enough of written about it that they that they forget about the Holocaust. Put it Thank that you. way. It does seem like a lot of the the um, popular World War II fiction is centered on female characters and being written by women and. There, maybe there's a whole other subset that's that's male characters and male writers, and I just haven't been sent those books. But but it does seem like a lot of it's centered on women. Why do you think that is? 
Well, I do think so. So I want to say there are several great male writers um, writing in this area. David Gillum and Ron Balson, Andrew Gross, and there's a whole bunch of guys writing. But you're right. When we look at the field of women that are writing this material, um, you know, and I could go on and on about them. There, there's there are a lot of women writing about it. And part, what I may just be more aware of the women, frankly, because um, uh, women writers just support each other incredibly, and it's just such a sisterhood of writers and people who are so generous with their their support um, that I may just be more aware of that. But in terms of the characters, I love writing about women during the war because in a normal time, these women would have lived on a very set path and, you know, had a very set trajectory. But from the war or other catastrophe, they're thrown off their path and they're tested and they're changed. And so um, I love to see how they respond to those challenges and grow. That's the joy for me in um, in writing about the women. And it's interesting, um, the, um, the, the Lost Girls of Paris has actually been optioned for film, which has certainly never happened to me before. And the woman who's kind of the driving force behind that project said to me uh, that she really feels this is very much a book for the Me Too move- movement and this moment we're in where women are finding their voices and strength. Well, congratulations. That's really exciting. Thank you. Yeah. I was just wondering the um, um, the girl that survived, the one that survived. I'm not going to spoil it, but the girl that survived, uh, she she had um, she didn't have a real um, oh, she didn't have a, a big family to to come back to or a big family to support her, but she had an inner strength that uh, I thought was really amazing. Well, thank you. And I mean, she, right. And, you know, um, so, yeah, and she had people depending on her as well. You yes, know, not to right, right. Help yeah. too much. Right. And, you know, one of the characters left her daughter behind when she went to do this. Were there actual, was that based on reality? Were there people who, some of these women yes. actually had children? They did. Oh, they wow. did. Some of them had, some of them that, had children. That and is amazing. That is amazing. Really you know, it's interesting if you read in the first few chapters, they say no mothers. We're not going to send mothers because they were trying. And then they just didn't have enough people. So I think that went by the wayside. And then they absolutely did send women who had children. It was interesting how these women were recruited. Um, was that based on some true stories as well? Yes. Yeah, so what was interesting was when they they decided to recruit women, they sort of had a problem of where to find women because – if you think about it, um, the men were recruited from the military, and they were recruited from colleges, and those weren't really places you found a lot of women in 1940 necessarily. So they found them from all walks of life, um, and they would bring them in to these unmarked offices on Baker Street and sort of give them a preliminary interview to see if they might be fit for a service, and this is all true. And then they would send them to these training schools. And the training schools were all over Britain, and they they trained alongside the men. Now, the one liberty I have taken in my book with respect to the training is that in reality, the women might have gone to two, three, or four training schools before being deployed, kind of a basic training, a specialty school, and some sort of finishing school before they were deployed. And in my book, for the sake of the story and moving things along, I only focused on one training facility in the Western Scottish Highlands, which was an actual facility, but I only focused on one. Now, did you visit any of the places that you wrote about? I did not visit the actual training facility. I lived in England for a few years, so um, I'm pretty familiar with London. I've spent a lot of time in Europe. But, you know, there are authors who, for one book, you know, need four trips to Italy, which sounds lovely, <laughs> but I don't. I have three small children. I don't have that lifestyle. So when I need to go, I go, and when I can't go, I rely on – books and maps and periodicals and the internet and correspondence and whatever I can get my hands on. And Google Earth can be a real lifesaver when you're trying to get details about a geographical location. That's such a good point. Yeah. You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today (coughs) is Pam Jenoff, author of The Lost Girls of Paris. 
Okay, I wanted to ask, is there a lot of information on the Internet about this time in, uh, immediately after the Second World War and some of these, some of these organizations? There's definitely a lot about the, the organizations and the work that they did. That, that's been pretty well covered. And, you know, there's all sorts of interesting little tidbits, which, which I try to weave into the book without dumping history. Um, for example, you know, the, the traditional British agencies did not like SOE. Um, if you think about a British clandestine service, they want everything quiet and, and, and undercover. And here the SOE was going in and sort of blowing up things and drawing a lot of attention. So there's been a lot written about the agencies and a lot written about the betrayals that happened um, and how the agents were caught. Um, I think sometimes it's harder to nail down the nuance of everyday life, you know, how to get the subways in New York City just right, for example. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially if you're writing about a time period where not a lot of people are left to ask about that. Or, right. or, or that that will still remember it anyway after as many years as have gone gone by. Or will remember so well that when I get something wrong, they'll send me an angry email. <laughs> Does that happen? <laughs> all the time, all the time. Although really? I should say, in the Wikipedia age, everybody loves the gotcha right with historical material. And fair enough, I should get it all right, and I never do. Um, there's always a mistake in a book. But it used to be that people would send you a quiet email, and now they tend to post nasty things on Goodreads and Amazon and Facebook. <laughs> so, oh. oh, for heaven's sake. Well, it's all right. Can you give us an example of something that someone corrected you on? And may, and are they well, always it, right? <laughs> well, it's interesting. That's such a good question. So I don't have an example from this book because it's only been out for a week. Um in my first book, Commandant's Girl, I was very worried that people would be upset about the relationship that this Jewish woman had um, with a German officer. And I didn't get angry emails about that, but I got these emails that said, you know, in 1939 Krakow, Jacob as a secular Jew never would have worn a yarmulke, um, those kinds of things. And so on my next book, we spent a ton of time trying to figure out whether a bus in London in 1946 would have cost two pence or five pence, and did the bus have doors? So that's the, the kind of the level of minutia you get down to because it really matters to people. People will write to me and say, you had her wearing a perfume in May 1919 that was not invented until June 1919. So we're really, you know, you we're really. Kidding. No, I got that one for the ambassador's daughter. I mean, every book, there, there's one thing that'll stick out. And of course, I regret it. Um, there are times when readers get things wrong. So someone once took issue with the fact that I said something like the Australians took a long time to get into the war and they got very huffy. And I had to point out to them the person who made this statement in my book was living in occupied Poland. So, of course, it felt like a long time to her. You know, sometimes Mm -hmm. it's not a factual error. It's a question of character perspective. Yeah. That's a good point. And there's so many points of view about things it's like, like, like Monica said, sometimes we don't remember exactly the exact things that happen. We, we think we do, but we don't. And because I'm, I'm that way at my age, I don't remember everything exactly the way it was. Um, and so when you're, you know, trying to, trying to tell somebody what happened, sometimes you get mixed up, let's face it. We do our best, and then we I do say, I say the the mistakes are all mine. And then if there's ever if there's ever a place where I diverge from history purposefully, I will try and mention it in the author's notes so that people know it was not an accident. So Pam, would you like to read a little bit from the Lost Girls of Paris? I would love to. So um, I've chosen a selection, and it's actually from the opening chapter. It's from Grace's perspective in New York. And just by way of background, um, as I said, Grace has been living in New York. She's a recent widow, and she feels guilty about her husband's death and conflicted about where she wants to go next. And um, so she's working, actually, in an office that helps immigrants in New York. She's she's working in an office. And one day, she's on her way to work, um, and she's late. 
and the scandalous reason that she is late is because um, she she was met a man the night before, and the man happened to be a friend of her deceased husband. So it's all very complicated. And Grace is rushing to work in the wrong direction, still wearing yesterday's clothes, um, and she tries to go down a street around uh, 43rd Street in New York, and she can't. It's blocked off because of an accident, um, which she'll later learn is Eleanor Triggs car accident death but at the time all she knows is she's trying to get to work and she does not want to go through grand central because that was where she was supposed to meet her husband the night he never arrived but her only choice is to go through grand central and as she's ducking through the dreaded train station she sees an unattended suitcase so what i'd like to do is just read you a bit after she finds the suitcase grace knelt to examine the suitcase there was nothing terribly extraordinary about it, rounded like a thousand other valises that travelers carried through the station every day, with a worn mother-of-pearl handle that was nicer than most. Only this one wasn't passing through. It was sitting under a bench unattended, abandoned. Had someone lost it? She stopped with a moment's caution, remembering a story during the war about a bag that was actually a bomb. But that was all over, the danger of invasion or other attack that had once seemed to lurk around every corner now faded. Grace studied the case for some sign of ownership. There was a name chalked onto the side. She recalled uneasily some of Frankie's clients, survivors whom the Germans had forced to write their names on suitcases in a false promise that they would be reunited with their belongings. This one bore a single word, trig. Grace considered her options, tell a porter or simply walk away. She was late for work, but curiosity, curiosity nagged at her. Perhaps there was a tag inside. She toyed with the clasp. It popped open in her fingers, seemingly of its own accord. She found herself lifting the lid a few inches. She glanced over her shoulder, feeling as though at any minute she might get caught. Then she looked inside the suitcase. It was neatly packed with a silver-backed hairbrush and an unwrapped bar of Yardley's lavender soap tucked in a top corner women's clothes folded with perfect creases. There was a pair of baby shoes tucked in the rear of the case, but no other sign of children's clothing. Suddenly, being in the suitcase felt like an unforgivable invasion of privacy, which, of course, it was. Grace pulled back her hand quickly. As she did, something sliced into her index finger. Out, she cried aloud in spite of herself. A line of blood an inch or more long, already widening with red bubbles, appeared. She put her finger to her mouth, sucking on the wound to stop the bleeding. Then she reached for the case with her good hand, needing to know what had cut her, a razor or a knife. Below the clothes was an envelope, maybe a quarter inch thick. The sharp edge of the paper had cut her hand. Leave it, a voice inside her seemed to say. But unable to stop herself, she opened the envelope. Inside lay a pack of photographs, wrapped carefully in a piece of lace. Grace pulled them out, and as she did, a drop of blood seeped from her finger onto the lace irreparably staining it. There were about a dozen photos in all, each a portrait of a single young woman. They looked too different to be related to one another. Some wore military uniforms, other cris others crisply pressed blouse blouses or blazers. Not one among them could have been older than 25. Holding the photos of these strangers felt too intimate, wrong. Grace wanted to put them away, forget what she had seen. But the eyes of the girl in the top photo were dark and beckoning. Who was she? Just then there were sirens outside the station, and it felt as though they might be meant for her, the police coming to arrest her for opening someone else's bag. Hurriedly, Grace struggled to rewrap the photos in the lace and put the whole thing back into the suitcase. But the lace bunched, and she could not get the packet back into the envelope. The sirens were getting louder now. There was no time. Furtively, she tucked the photos into her own satchel, and she pushed the suitcase back under the bench with her foot, well out of sight. Then she started for the exit, the wound on her finger throbbing. I should have known, she muttered to herself, that no good could ever come from going into the station. Mm. That's it. You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and that was Pam Jenoff reading from The Lost Girls of Paris. And so the mystery begins. <laughs> um. There's also elements of romance to the story, but that's really not the focal point of this book, is it? 
No, it's not. In fact, it's funny. I have small children, and one of them was asking, could she, could she read one of my books? And I was thinking this might be the easiest one to, uh, to let her <laughs> read. Um, you know, there, there's a few different storylines that involve sort of romance here. Not Eleanor's, because she's the spy master, and she has no time for it. Um, but the, the romances are Grace, you know, as I said, has just had this one-night stand, which is almost unthinkable in 1946, but she has with her husband's best friend from college and she assumed it was a one night stand and she'd never see this fellow again but he pretty quickly reappears on the scene and not only makes clear that he's interested in more than a one night stand uh, but that he can help her solve the mystery of the girls in the photos and she's not so sure she's not looking for a relationship but she's attracted to him and she wants to know what happened to the girl so there's two incentives there and then there's a relationship back in the storyline in France um, during the war. Um, Marie, who is the young mother, she's not married, um, she finds herself drawn to Julian, who's the leader of the Vesper circuit. And they're not an easy pairing either. You know, um, Marie was, was jilted by her husband and left alone, so she's not really looking to trust. And Julian lost his family tragically during the war, and he's got the weight of the whole organization, the whole network on his shoulders. So um, they, have, they have a prickly beginning. Um, what's interesting about that is there really were um, romances and there really were love triangles among these SOE agents out in the field. Now, oh, were, really? Were there like any diaries or journals or first-person accounts of the agents in the field? There were a number of the agents who, after the war, wrote books or, you know, spoke to biographers or consulted on um, movies. Um, the, the Life and Secrets book, I think, is one in particular where they were, a were able to talk to Vera Atkins, because unlike my Eleanor, who's killed in a car accident, Vera really did live for quite some time after the war mm. and talk to people. I can imagine that that when you're in that situation of so much, um, I mean, you're in a life and death situation all the time, that rom romance could be both a um, kind of a, a release from it, but also it's heightened. The whole romantic aspect would be heightened because you don't know if this person that you're with is going to be be there tomorrow. Right, so these are young people. I mean, some were married, I guess, but you know, young young people, male and female, out in the field, living together in isolation and dangerous circumstances for a long time on end. You know, and it was very dangerous. At one point, the life expectancy of a radio operator in the field was something like it was either a couple of weeks or a month. I mean, really, really short when these people oh were just gosh. being captured. And so um, their lives were very much on the line. They would be living in these little groups together and. When you, it's interesting when you look at the many theories of betrayal and what might have happened to cause the agent's downfall. One is that there was a French woman who was in love with one of the male agents and uh, sort of lost out to a, a female agent in that relationship, and so um, she, some people think, turned turned them in out of jealousy. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, gosh. I mean, I can't imagine that they were able to recruit them as dangerous as it was. I, it, it just amazes me. That they were able to do that. I was say, did they know when they went over there what the life expectancy was? They were told pretty quickly. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they were there were not really any, I think, delusions. I don't think they were sold, you know, anything. The people who went, and yet they still went. Yes, although I don't think anyone could have predicted that things would fall apart as quickly as they did. Mm. Um, what, what, you know, among the, thing that, the things that happened is SOE grew too big for its own good because if you want to have a good spy network, you keep it small and you don't link it to other spy networks. Um, and, and what happened here is all the networks became really big and really entangled so that when one agent, when one agent was compromised, it would just everything would sort of fall like a house of cards after that. So I'm not sure they thought it would get that bad. Wow. Um, you mentioned that Grace is working, has this job in New York, uh, working in a law office helping immigrants. And one thing I found really interesting about the book is, about this story, is that 
it seemed like the whole issue of immigration was as controversial then as it is today. And is that partly why you had her doing that, working with immigrants? Um, so it's interesting, the issue of immigration and refugees and sanctuary. Um, it, when I wrote Orphan's Tale, and I know I spoke to you back in the day, um, I didn't set out to write a story about those themes, but it just so happened to come out right when everything was coming to the fore with the, 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 the you know, the immigrants and everything. Um, and so those themes of sanctuary and our own personal responsibility to others really came through. With this book, I didn't necessarily have her do it because of the immigration theme, but it was sort of interesting, one, to shed a light on all these people that were coming to New York after the war and kind of their struggles, um, but also to see how the war looked from the New York point of view, from Grace's point of view, from her boss Frankie's point of view, before she even became involved with the girls. Um, I do think, though, just to go a little bit off of that, that a theme emerged which I did not intend in writing The Lost Girls of Paris, and that is a very timely theme of the trust that we place in our government and whether mm. such trust is warranted. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was wondering if you were going to bring that I was going to bring that up, too. That was, bring it that up. was amazing. <laughs> to, I mean, yeah, of course, I'm... It's, and true, it's kind of, and true. Yeah. And, and that, that was true, that, that part was true. Yes, that was true. I mean, there are multiple, multiple theories of how the girls were betrayed, but that is certainly a prevailing theory. And what I can say without sort of giving too much away is that one of the ways the agents were captured was through the radio. So um, the British government would talk to the agents over a wireless set. And there was an elaborate system of security and code names and ciphers and crystals that was supposed to protect the radio. Um, But at some point, the Germans got a hold of one or more radios, and they were able to play those back to London, impersonating the agents. And in so Mm -hmm. doing, London was sending over information about drops of arms and men and safe houses, and the Germans were just scooping those up and using those to arrest people. They called it radio spiel or radio game uh, when they tricked the British like that. I think it wouldn't have taken that long for the British to realize they were being tricked or that that, that this information was getting through to the Germans. Well, that's the question of when did they realize it and what did they do when they knew. Right, right. And we don't want to give give too much away. We won't. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, once you start reading this book, you're going to... You mean give yourself some time because you're gonna you're not gonna want to put it down. I can I guarantee you. <laughs> now, Pam, in your bio, it mentions that you worked for the State Department handling Holocaust issues in Poland. How much of that work um, influences your writing? So that work was almost 25 years ago. I was sent by the U.S. State Department to Krakow. And I was there right after the Cold War had ended, and there were all of these issues from World War II that had never been resolved, and I became very intimately involved in handling and resolving those issues. And it really transformed me personally as well as professionally. So I regard my books as love songs to the people who lived through that most difficult era, And even if the story doesn't come from my personal experiences, like SOE, which I learned about years later, um, my love for the period and the things that it can illuminate for us comes from the years I spent over there. Are any of your books directly about situations or characters that you learned about during that time? So I believe that real life makes for terrible plot, but it makes for for wonderful setting. Yes. Um, so in general, what I do is I take all the stories and experiences and I weave them into the place rather than the actual plot. Um, there have been true things that I learned that really have influenced my book. So, for example, when I came back from Poland, I discovered there was a rich history of uprising and resistance in Krakow that I never knew about when I lived there. And when I went back and researched it, that became the underpinning for a commandant's girl. Uh Um, So so stories I have learned along the way. Um, When I was at the Pentagon, I went to a World War II commemoration in Slovakia 
high in the mountains, a cabin where a young girl had aided the partisans in, you know, resisting. And that true story inspired my book, The Winter Guest. So little nuggets will inspire things, but I don't generally seek to write true stories. <laughs> but you are a historian. By training, I By am. Training. Yeah. <laughs> By training. Now, is, does that training really come to play in your research for these, for your books? I love research, and I think the love comes from those years. And I'll tell you what the, the, that training gave me, ironically. I did a research degree at Cambridge. That's my history degree. I have a master's, which was a completely self-driven degree with just an enormous you know, dissertation at the end of it, two years of work on a dissertation. And when I was done that, I said, well, if I can write this dissertation, I can finish writing a book. So on some level, it simply gave me that push-through confidence. Um, but I do – just sort of have that, I feel like, historian's instinct in finding material and finding out things and using sources. Um, it also comes from the fact that, you know, I was a lawyer and I teach uh, legal writing and research at Rutgers. And so um, a lot of that helps as well. So how do you have time to be a novelist? And with 10, ten novels over how many years? About 12 years, let's say. Okay, so almost a novel a year and most of them requiring some research, and you're teaching, and you have three children at home, um, something's not adding up here. <laughs> <laughs> Wendy, you sleep. I do, that's what I want to know. Do too, I do too many things and none of them well, um, which is, but, but I really, the truth is I love everything I do. All I do is the momming, the teaching, and the writing, and even if I hit Powerball, I would still do all three of those. I would just slow down a little bit. Um, uh, you know. And also, I'm very lucky. Um, my mom is a mile away. I have a husband who could juggle babies. You know, um, I, I, I have a, a, the whole village or the whole army to help me, especially now when I'm on a massive book tour. Um, so, uh, you, you know, I have a, a lot of help in that regard. Um, and, and just, you know, somehow it gets done. Wow. Like everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it's, it, it seems like you, you had a really full career before you started writing novels. Did you always want to, to write fiction? Was that something that, you know, was always on the back of your mind that, that you wanted to do, but you decided you better get a, a day job first? So what happened was I was a little kid who always wanted to be a novelist ever since I was little. And all through those years of school and living abroad when I had time to write, I just never got going. And for me, the turning point was 9-11. I had left government and gone to law school, and I became a practicing attorney on September 4th, 2001. And one week later, 9-11 happened. And I had this moment where I said, you know, it's fine to be a lawyer, but my goodness, if I had been a 9-11 victim, I never would have realized my dream of becoming a writer. And so I took a night course that was actually called Write Your Novel This Year. And I started to work on my first book, but I still had to, I still had to be at the law firm. So I used to write those books from 5 to 7 in the morning back in the day. Have you ever participated in um, National Novel Writing Month? I, you know, they changed the workshop later to write your novel this month, ah! which sounds incredibly <laughs> scary to me. I'm not ready for that. Um, but, but I, um, you know, so I'm not a, a I'm, and I've actually slowed down. Like when you said I write a book a year, I, it's more like every two years now. I think just for me, as I get older, creatively and commercially, I'd much rather slow down and do a better job. Now, do you have people, fans, that are waiting for your next book? I do, but there's ten of them, so they must have something they haven't read. <laughs> like, come on, people. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> now, there, there are authors that, not anymore because I've, I don't have time anymore, but when I was younger, that I would read every single book that they published. And sometimes some of them were pretty prolific. Um but I don't know. You you end up getting a getting feeling a connection, and and then sometimes like after the fifteenth or sixteenth book, you realize they aren't really as good as they were, or either either that or I as a reader have changed, and the the topics that they write about don't interest me as much as they did. But it's hard to let go of 
I'm feeling I need to read every single one of them. I know what so, you mean. Yeah. That's what you mean. Yeah. And uh, so you're going to continue this. Um, do you have, like, how far ahead in terms of story ideas do you work? Do you already have the next the next book in, in you've probably already started working on it would be my guess but um and the one after that you used to have a seed of an idea or how far ahead do you work i'm pretty much only one idea ahead because i usually you know sort of come to terms with my publisher on whether that's the idea that's going to go forward so i might have other notions i'd like to do someday um but i always have the next one ready to go and I can't work on a new book until the the last one is actually finished and you know ready for production. But once that happens, I don't give myself a break. I start right away, and so I, I am working on something new, but it's pretty early to say. So, this book was the the new book was just published. Did you say? Uh, it came out on January twenty ninth. January so just 29th. published. So, when would you have been finished? completely finished with your role in producing this book in a perfect world or in reality <laughs> in reality <laughs> in a perfect world in a perfect world i should have a book done a year out but in this one with the edits we were still you know really rushing last minute details in june okay okay but still so from june you start working on the next one then so, well, no, because pages came back to me a few times with more edits, and we also had to um, come up with a new idea. So um, I guess I've been on, in earnest on the new project maybe since the beginning of December. Okay, okay. And you'll spend – do you start researching before you – do you research before you write, or do you do them at the same time? I'm what I would describe as a contemporaneous researcher, so I only need a little bit of research before I start, and then I can do more targeted research once I'm writing. How do you keep track of your research? In, in notebooks, folders, um, in the very rough document where I'm writing, all sorts of things. Okay. So you're not – when you say you're a pantser, that, that – uh, not only do you not, uh, like, structure the novel before you start but you're you sort of just you don't have an organizational system on the research either <laughs> no i'm i'm all <laughs> over the place uh you mentioned that you did a dissertation for a master's in history what was the topic of that it was race relations between Japan and the West, 1895 to 1925. So it was about the way that our mistreatment of Japan and its citizens contributed to animosity after World War One. And did that then lead into World War Two, possibly? Was that part of the causation? Yes, yes, wow. it was completely set the tone for it. So I, I love the World War One period as well, and the sort of Paris Peace Conference and all of that. Oh wow. Well, we're about out of time, and I know you need to need to jump off. So, um, Mom, do you have some final words? Yes, I do. This, I think this this goes to these these women that gave their lives. The good in the game of life is to develop your talents and skills, and then give them back to the world. I think that's wow. very appropriate. So, Pam, thank you so much for being with us today on Writers' Voices. My pleasure. Thanks for having me again. I hope to speak to you soon. I hope so, too. I'll look forward to your next book. I love reading them. And that's all for today. See you next week on Writer's Voices.